and in today's video I'm going to be taking this fairly basic canopy fit out and I'm going to transform it to the next level which will make it lighter, cooler and more efficient which will keep you off grid for longer. Again, welcome back to everybody. I know it's been a while since we managed to get any work done here in the shed, long-term viewers will know. And as a result, the place looks like an absolute shambles. Honestly, there is crap everywhere and it's doing my head in. Sometimes life gets in the way though. And now it's time to start ticking off these jobs. I'm gonna start with some low-hanging fruit as I improve up on my canopy setup. Now, if you've been watching along on our D-Max series, you will have already seen how I fitted out my 1650mm dog section TC boxes canopy. And honestly, it's been coping really well. Some of you may remember I took it on a massive two week journey up into WA's Pilbara region and then back home again. I've also done a couple of little overnight camps and stuff with some mates. But now that I've lived with it for about six months or so, there's a couple of things that I wouldn't mind changing. And do remember that before I went on that big two week trip, I rushed to get this finished. It was literally down to the wire. I put the fridge in the night before we left. There's certainly some things that had I had some more time, I may have done differently or some additional things that I would have liked to have put in. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to make sure that this thing is set up for the future so that I don't have to revisit this again. So first things first, in order to make the, uh, the first job quite easy, we literally need to pull everything out. So let's just pull it all out and start again. Oh, geez, these things are heavy. Ah, oh, should have thought about that before I lost all my lighting. <laughs> One, two, three. Far out. That is just unnecessary. Oh. I'm so glad when I designed this, I made it super modular and easy to get out. Actually, I'm able to get this board out with the fridge slide and the battery still in. I have had to do it before because I had one of these crimps fail. But uh, yeah, really glad that I took the time to plan that. Now that she's back to bare bones, let's get stuck into job number one. Now the first thing I wanna get ticked off the list in this thing is insulation. This one being a raw alloy canopy is probably not quite as bad as some of the powder coated black ones. However, when we did go up north and the temperature tipped 40 degrees, you could tell that the fridge was in here working hard trying to keep all that stuff cool and also this is a dog section canopy as you can see over there and we take our big girl missy out with us so if i can make the things a little bit more comfortable for her while we're out on the move that is definitely well worth doing so today i'm going to be using some of this stuff here it's like a four mil thick uh thermal liner this is the stuff here actually we can get that from the big green shed i'm certainly not pioneering here i actually got put onto this product and this idea from another content creator dan from Explorebound, so he did a really good video showing his installation uh, of this insulation <laughs> and also did a pretty good uh, AB test on his canopy where he saw a dramatic decrease in his internal canopy temps. So I'll put a link to that in the description below if you'd like to see it. However, I'm gonna follow the similar principles. I'm just gonna be measuring out each of my sections here and going along cutting with a razor blade because this stuff is fairly thin and then sticking it down with some Sikaflex so it doesn't move. All right, let's get stuck in. Now in doing this, I measured quite carefully and made sure I transferred that down onto the roll of thermal liner, making the pieces slightly oversized so that they would wedge in there quite tightly and then using the Sikaflex to secure it in place. Now, I had an old school builder type tell me once that if you put circles of adhesive on your sheets, then when you press them and you give them a bit of a rub up and down, 
it creates like a suction cup effect and it really like pulls it in. I don't know if it's bullshit or not, but I uh, figured I'd give it a go. Let me know in the comments uh, if I've been had. Right, thermal liner is on. We've managed to get it across all of the external surfaces. So the roof, the headboard, backboard. I even did in the dog section and we managed to get in all of the little nooks and crannies along the roof next to the doors. Basically everywhere is 100% covered. Now, I know a couple of you experts are gonna be saying, oh, but Jeff, you didn't do the doors yet. Yes, I know I didn't do the doors yet, but that's because it is going to be totally unobstructed and I can get to them at any time. In the interest of keeping on moving forward, I'm just going to keep pushing along with the stuff in here. Now you'd be thinking, alrighty, this is on, insulation is done. Well, nah, nah. whilst I'm sure this is going to do a great job of heat dissipation, they've got to go to an extra step and it's going to be lining out the canopies. Yep, so we're going to be boarding out the canopy and this is uh, a little test piece now I'm going to be using three mil ply board for a couple of reasons it is light it is cheap and it doesn't use up too much bulky space don't want to be adding too much weight to this setup where we can in addition to looking really nice once it is carpeted once this board is attached to the frame here the air gap between the thermal liner and the plywood is going to add, I guess, a second level of insulation, which will also help in keeping the canopy cool on those hot days. So if your canopy is cool, that means your fridge isn't working as hard, which means you're not using as much power from your battery and you can go longer without a charge. Also, this has got a dog section. I want to keep my poor dog nice and cool on them hot days. So let's start cutting out some board, carpeting some board, fitting it up inside. Okay. That will fit. Nice. Remember, always leave a gap for your carpet. That will get filled in easily. Beautiful. Roof panels and that have all been cut out. I've test fitted them. They're going to be mint and it's time to put some carpet on. Now I've got this stuff here, which is a charcoal automotive uh, carpet, which is a little bit thinner than marine carpets. The same stuff that I used back when I did the electrical board, if you remember that. Now, a lot of the time for this sort of stuff, I would use a contact adhesive, something like the trusty quick grip, which you'd find at the big green shed. However, this is going to be a roof panel it is going to be subject to a fair bit of heat 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to try some of this stuff, which is an artificial grass adhesive that apparently this stuff is super duper sticky. Because this is going to be a roof lining panel, I don't want it to sag like a VY headlining. It's going to use something pretty good and I will probably spread it with like a, where is it? Found it, a V-notch trowel. So we'll pro try and spread it f fairly thin and then scrape across. Hopefully that'll give us the result we need from there. We'll then put it on our carpet and fix it up onto the roof for good. Get your hands dirty. Wow, that stuff really sticks, holy crap. Now, I thought I'd take a second just to show you guys how I get my corners. A lot of people will sort of notch and cut and this and that. I'll leave mine square like this, um, and I'll show you why. First off, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna peel this over Peel it over as tight as I can, and then try and pin it on the edge. Like that. Not at the corner, a little bit further back. And then this time we're gonna do the same. Peel it over, pin it a little bit further back from the corner. Bang, now you got this flat, right? Pinch it together and pull it over. Now, when you do that, you can sort of feel the ridge of where this side runs into it. You want to get your staple gun right up against that and pin it on the 45. Now fold it over, do the same. You can feel where that's gone in there, bang. Now, once you've done that, you want to get a sharp blade and a pull. Pull it back this way, horizontally, as flat as you can. Slice it. Like that. That's nice, flat, perfect join. You barely be able to tell. That saves a hell of a lot of time rather than trying to find where your corner's gonna be and notch it, whatever. Just leave it square, fold it over and slice that flap off. Always gives me a really good result and it means I can pull it tighter around this corner as well. Okay, roof is in. How good is that? It looks a bit dark on camera, but it's actually not too bad at all. Look at that. You can see, remember that huge gap that I had? Totally filled by the carpet. Truth be told, I actually made that gap a little bit bigger after I made that shot because I was like, oh, is that going to be enough? So I made it a little bit bigger and that actually worked out really good. If there's not enough gap, when the carpet goes in there, then you start getting it all wavy and stuff. And I'll show you an example. When I put this ceiling piece in, this is on the driver's side. You can kind of see it didn't quite wedge in there. Now, it still looks pretty good. But that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I say that you didn't have enough gap there for your carpet. It will take up that space. And then because we're using such thin material, remember it's only three mil ply, it's going to bend and flex and bow. But if I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't know. So... I'm pretty happy with that. I've also done this back wall. I did that off camera because, you know, I kind of want to get this done sometime in this lifetime. And you may have seen when I fixed the roof in that I put some of these right angle brackets in, something like this here. 
Now to do that, all I did was use some scrap aluminium box tube and cut it up, made some nice little L brackets so that that way, when the back wall goes in, it'll sit up against these beams, but there's nothing for me to fix it to in this corner. So it'll be a bit floppy. That's why I've put them in there. So I can fire a screw through there and that'll hold it nicely. And because we've already run that wire through, we are ready to just tuck it in there. So why don't we do that? Got her all put back together. How good is that looking? And I've hooked up a little 12 volt power supply so I can get my lighting back. <laughs> but I'm actually super pumped with how that's come together. The roof is looking really good, even with that small gap. That actually looks way worse on camera than it does in person. I really like how this light now looks like it's sort of flush mounted or recessed in. That actually looks really, really slick. And whilst this headboard was out, I actually took the opportunity to make a few changes and some updates uh, on the electrical side of things as well. A couple of the eagle-eyed will notice a couple of differences. I've now got a 50 amp circuit breaker here. And what I'm using that for is to power a couple of like high amperage power outlets so that I can run stuff like, I don't know, like a camp oven or an air compressor. And that'll happen via this Anderson plug just down here. And there's also one over on the other side as well. A couple other small changes would be that I've now switched out my six-way fuse box for a 12-way. So I already had this one tapped out with everything that I had. Now by adding in a couple extra circuits, being that I've got a 30-amp output on the front of the canopy as well as a 30-amp output in the dog section in case the dog doesn't come. That way I can put in say another fridge which we could use as a dedicated freezer or a beer fridge just depending on what the situation is i could also use those as regulated power inputs therefore i could use say a solar blanket or whatever and plug that in i've also removed the 25 amp kick ass dc dc charger which this honestly great unit and i had absolutely no intention of charging it however I did manage to get this unit on an absolute ripper deal on Marketplace. So we've moved across to the Red Arc Core 40, which is a 40 amp DC charger. It was brand new. Honestly, the dude bought it and then changed his mind because all the rest of his stuff was Victron and he wanted a Victron charger. So I managed to get a bargain, which is just awesome. Still does the exact same stuff as the kick-ass unit does with a built-in MPPT solar charging system. So I can do solar as well as um, alternator charging at a much higher rate of 40 amps. That's going to help replenish the battery a lot quicker than the other one. Um, so I'll have to do less driving or I can input more solar to then get that charged up a lot faster when we're talking about high amperage, high demand appliances. Talking high demand appliances, it's not going to get much more high demand than the one we're about to fit. Now... If you watched the previous canopy video, you know that I was supposed to already have this in there, but it was on back order. So where's my inverter, kick-ass? Where's it at? <laughs> I'm assuming it must be on back order, but you know, haven't got an email to that effect yet. However, this is a kick-ass 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter. These things do draw a lot of power, hence the motivation to want to go to a 40 amp charger. Really, really handy to have when you got an off-grid setup. The original plan was something that I would be able to plug the laptop in, maybe charge some 18-volt power tool batteries while we're on the road or at events or something. Might be able to record a podcast on location. Why not buy one big enough to take an air fryer camping with you? You know what I mean? It's the little things. So here it is. Comes with a connected wiring kit. There she is. It's a pretty beefy looking unit. Very sleek though. We got our uh, power 12 volt power input there, our 240 volt output there. It's also got a 240 volt input. If you're plugged into shore power, uh, say at a caravan park or something like that, it will then bypass the 12 volt input 
uh, and not use your battery it'll just use the 240 volt that's supplied usb outlet there which i probably won't use we've got the remote input which we've already got the remote fitted because that wasn't on back order and we got that on time and it's also rcd protected which is really really good i do have some concerns though here is the wiring kit that they supply with the inverter which is some um, 25 mil square or maybe three gauge uh, or three bns cable in my mind not thick enough if you were to rate that cable for uh current maybe about 160 amps now 2000 watt at 12 volt you'd be looking at about 160 amp but that is putting this cable on the ragged edge so not going to be using that also they don't supply a fuse or a circuit breaker to go with it so that's something else that you would need to buy if you're fitting one once again i don't believe that cable is adequate we're going to be using something a fair bit more substantial this is a 50 millimeter square or a zero bns cable and this would be rated to more like 250 amps so that gives us plenty of headroom we're not worried about burning the car down or melting cable look i'm sure kickass have their people who have done a lot of testing to see if this would be adequate or not however i don't know particularly in an off-road application where you got a lot of like vibrations and things i'm just it just doesn't sit right with me hence why we're going this way won't bore you too much with the install you've already seen me cut and carpet enough so i've already made the mounting board so let's just get it straight in the canopy There you can see I'm using some countersunk head screws and putting them in from the back. That means that this board's going to be nice and flat when we put it up against our mounting surface and it will hold the inverter nice and securely. Anyone who's dealt with really thick cables or even like fat AN hose will know that making something that short is actually really difficult. <laughs> The hardest part about that was making those cables and building that board. Two things that I didn't even film, but actually putting the inverter in is like a five minute job. So super pumped with that. As you would have seen, I'm running a 200 amp circuit breaker, which probably should run a 250 amp fuse. I'm gonna trial this and see how I go. If I have to change it later, should be all right. 200 amp is, is more than adequate for 2000 watt. The only issue that you have is that some high wattage appliances and things like kettles or toasters even if they are a 2000 watt appliance they have what they call like a startup wattage um, which can spike to nearly double that this inverter is 4000 watt rated for that startup wattage however at 4000 watts you could be drawing upwards of 300 amps on the 12 volt side so you may get some nuisance circuit breaker trips hopefully that won't be the case this little remote panel super pumped on that actually really really do enjoy that it's really handy being able to just press the button it comes up with a little screen you can plug in your 240 volt appliance and it's going to tell you exactly how much wattage you're drawing what your battery voltage is etc etc super nice little bit of kit actually for now we've done enough adding weight to the canopy we've made it nice we've made it livable we've added a bunch of features but now it's time to see what kind of weight we can take away so let's put this thing on a diet bloody hell ah. this is my kick-ass 170 amp hour agm deep cycle battery and this thing 
is a beast. 170 amp hours is a bunch of power, particularly for something like one of these. And AGMs are really handy because you can mount them just about anywhere except for upside down. And they're very resilient when it comes to things like vibration. That's what makes them really handy for four wheel drive dual cycle batteries. The problem with AGM, whilst they are half or a third of the price of a lithium battery, they are heavy AF. This thing here, you saw me struggling to lift it just before, is 45 kilos. That's a lot of weight. The other drawback to an AGM battery, whilst it's advertised as 170 amp hour, on average, you're only going to get to use about 50% of that before this thing goes to a low voltage. So really, we're looking at about 85 amp hour of usable power with most fridges drawing on average about two amp hour over a long period of time. That means that this thing will run without a single charge input for over 48 hours before you have any dramas. But with high amperage appliances, you also need a high amp discharge. And this battery here is only rated to 50 amp continuous discharge. That just isn't gonna cut it. Enter the ATG LifePo4 lithium battery. This little unit, while still a little bit weighty on the arms, is half the weight of its predecessor at 24 kilos. This one has a whopping 200 amp hour capacity. Now, the difference between the two, remember the AGM I said would only get about 50% of usage. Lithiums, you can use basically 100. They say 80% is a good ceiling. Uh, that stops it from going to too low of a voltage. However, this thing will continue to give you 12 volt until the BMS or the battery management system taps out. At 80%, you would then get 160 amp hour of usable storage as opposed to the 85 with the kick-ass AGM battery. That means I've halved my weight, I've doubled my capacity, and this thing has a 250 amp continuous discharge rating, which means we can suck everything that that inverter has to offer, and this thing will absolutely laugh at it. Triple the price of the kick-ass AGM battery, so it is something to consider if you are um, trying to operate on a budget. For me, the positives far outweigh the negatives, particularly long-term if you are looking to go camping off-grid. The extra bonus is that these two, you might notice, are in an identical battery case, which means I don't have to change anything back there. This will be a direct swap. Just realized as soon as I disconnect that power supply, I'm gonna lose my lights again. All right, it's gonna get dark. This is all really starting to come together now. And the frustrating part is if I told my wife to come in here, she'd probably say something like, well, the carpet looks nice, but otherwise it's not really any different. Super annoying considering we've got so much more charging capacity. We can use so many more appliances. We can charge it far more efficiently and it's insulated, which is probably the main thing that I really wanted to get done. It's all good though. It's time to do the last thing and that's put the fridge back in. However, I am making a change there as well. Now this old 65 liter Waco has been keeping my beers cold for well over a decade. It's been transferred between multiple vehicles, but it's time to give it an early retirement. Whilst the fridge itself is great, doesn't draw much power, not super heavy either at about 28 kilos, she really is a good thing. However, the problem comes when you're using a chest fridge in a canopy when you have to buy a slide. Now, this is a very quality piece. It's an MSA DS50 drop slide. I'm fairly tall, which means I can see into the top of this at this height. However, my wife is about yay high and she can't. So being able to pull this out and drop it down 300 mil, which gives you really good access to looking into the top of the chest freezer and then putting it back away again. Issue being, the slide itself weighs probably, I 
think it's 38 kilos according to the MSA website. If you can try and do away with the slide and still have good fridge access, that's got to be a good thing, right? We've already saved 25 kilos by changing to a lithium battery, which well and truly negates any of the weight that we've put in by the plyboards. Why not keep going and swap this out for something that's going to work a little bit better? The fridge everybody loves to hate, myself included. The 85 litre Adventure Kings upright fridge is always a great source of debate, particularly amongst the recreational adventure tourers, amongst the entire internet. Now, if you're in the industry, you probably hate them. If you're on a budget, no doubt you absolutely love them. This is where I'm at a bit of a moral crossroads. If you've been following us for a while, you probably know that we are dead against companies who send quality engineered and designed products overseas to be reverse engineered and developed to undercut the market. You certainly wouldn't be blamed for assuming that that's what's happened with this lineup here. Now, because of this, I was pretty much dead against or not even considering purchasing one of these fridges. In fact, I was pretty well dead set on buying a Dometic NRX 80 litre which is one of their new models because as far as I can tell, one of the most efficient fridges on the market. When I, this popped up at $460 at my local four-wheel drive super center, reality kind of flicked a switch and told me that, you know, I can buy three of these for the price of one Dometic. Something's got to give. <laughs> Sometimes you do have to be realistic and, you know, I'm not scared to give it a try. It does come with a five-year warranty, so... They seem to back their product and because I do have a four-wheel drive super center not too far from where I live, an exchange process shouldn't be too difficult. Now, according to some campers, there are some minor drawbacks to using one of these compared to one of the market leaders, one of them being that they are a little bit hungry on the juice. There are modifications available. If you've seen there that people out there doing what they call a fan mod where you can try and spread the cold air more evenly within the cabinet that's something i may entertain doing but at the moment i'm just going to try it as is particularly with the insulated uh, canopy hopefully that will help and sometimes you get the odd faulty compressor but when you're talking about a mass-produced product sometimes these things are going to happen now fitting this thing is fairly easy obviously it's just got an anderson plug on the back which for me means it's going to be a bit plug and play however one of the major differences in using a liftoff canopy versus a chassis mounted canopy is that you will have this 50 mil lip. As you can see, the floor is not flush and we do have that rather large lip there, which means that unfortunately, if you try to open the door, she gets a little bit stuck. So I am going to have to make a bit of a fridge mount sort of thing, uh, which I've already kind of mocked up and I'm just about to give it a test fit. So. Let's see if it works. There you go, that is essentially how it's going to fit. So because I had to lift it up about 55 mil just to clear this lip, I figured why not send it up as high as I can to the top of the roof. One, it gives me more space down here for some additional storage, things that you probably don't use very often but wouldn't mind having easy access to, like tools, snatch strap, cutlery, stuff like that. Two, all of the mounting points on these Adventure Kings fridges are actually down at the bottom of the case. Some of them, are the other fridges like your Bushman's or your Dometic, they'll have mounting points up the side where you'd put them in, say, like a cage. And these ones are a little bit different in that regard. I figured if I put it up so that it's basically touching the roof, if any of these mounting points down at the bottom were to come loose while we're out on the tracks, it's not gonna be able to bounce up and out of this little cradle. At the moment, obviously the cradle's not attached to the base, I'm just sort of mocking it up, but it will be attached, all sort of bolted together as one uh, unit, and this base will obviously be bolted down through the floor of the canopy. It will be super, super solid by the time it's in there. Now you're probably wondering what the hell is going on here. I've made a bit of a mess of the wood, but it isn't a mistake, and it's probably where things are getting a little bit ridiculous. I've got one of these from JCar. It's a twin 15 watt fast charge, sort of wireless charging pad. And I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a way of utilizing that and hiding it in the canopy somewhere. And I think I found the perfect spot. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to grab that. And I've made a nice little recess here in the plyboard, which fits that down nice, perfectly and flush. I've also got a little bit of a track so that the power cable can then go up and behind um, the power board where there is a power source for it. 
and then I'll lay down the glue, put the carpet over the top, and what do you know, there's gonna be a hidden twin wireless charging pad sitting right there in the canopy. So when I get back from out on my daily adventures, I can just grab my phone, throw that down, grab a beer. Mate, how good is that? I say, it's probably a little bit ridiculous, but probably worth the effort. So now that I've proven that this all works the way that I want it to, I'm going to pull the fridge out and pull that mount apart, um, carpet it up and refit it for the final time. And once the fridge is in, that's it, we're done. How good? It doesn't actually use all that much of space. It's only about a quarter of the canopy. Obviously the dog section's free, yet we've still got 200 amp hour lithium, 2000 watt of 240 volt supply power, 85 litre fridge. We've got all of our electrical wiring. We've got, you know, remote inverter. We've got switches for everything. I've got heaps of charging ports, power supplies. Boys, does it get any better? <laughs>say i'm properly stoked with how all this has turned out it's come up really really nice it was good before but now next level that's what i'm saying level up canopy 20 liters of extra fridge capacity we've doubled our battery capacity we now have access to 240 volt power off grid 40 amp dc dc charging so we can get it back topped up nice and quick the insulation can't wait until summer to see what the results of that are going to be because like i said when i did take this thing up north the waco in there certainly did struggle you could tell that it was chewing a lot of power when we we're on the road it was fine because it was charging while we we're on the road but yeah during the day it was chewing a lot and i was also using quite a fair bit overnight so it'll be interesting to see how this bargain basement fridge that nobody likes but everybody loves is gonna do i have plugged it in it took about 45 minutes to get down to temp and we're about three hours in now and doesn't look like it's using bugger all power now it is winter it shouldn't use much it's not going to be working too hard in this climate summer is going to be the real test check the comments 
down below and I'll give you a more uh, extended view once I've finished editing this video of an average of how much power draw this fridge actually uses. Like I say, there's a couple of mods that I can do to it. If you guys want to see that, let us know. What am I going to do with this section? There'll be a lot of people saying that this is prime for a slide out pantry and some drawers and things like that. But right now, for me and, and where I'm at, I'm going to leave it. With this open space, believe it or not, I can actually fit the two Wee 50s in here, as well as one or two crates for like food and some sleeping stuff. Tied swags on the roof and we're away for the weekend. So if I was to put a drawer in, say it's about this high so I can store a bunch of stuff like a slide out kitchen. I can't put the kids bikes or the Wee 50s in here anymore. When they get a little bit older and their bikes are bigger and they don't fit anyway, then I probably will do a bit of a kitchen fit out for now. While they're young, if you can go motorbike riding without even having to take the canopy off or tow a trailer, then why not? <laughs> I'm already loving the wireless charging. My phone is actually on charge right now. Um, that, as gimmicky as it seems, is going to be super cool when you get to camp. Open the door, grab a beer, chuck the phone down, walk away. It's charging. Don't need a wire. It's all sweet. And I think I'm also really going to enjoy these extra Anderson outlets as well as having power on the other side of the canopy because whilst it's not that often that I'm chasing power, that is going to be, you know, really, really handy to have. And also having the Anson plug in the dog section I've put in there means that I can carry an extra fridge if I wanted to. This is it for now. Of course, everybody wants more upgrades and whatever. However, I do have to turn my attention to the two other projects that are in my shed and get them well underway. The wagon is probably about 70% finished. The SLE is, you know, nowhere even close, but we do need to get cracking on those two. All I'm gonna do now is stick this back on the car and I'm gonna enjoy some camping with my family over spring and summer, beach missions with the boys, throw some food in the fridge, chuck the barbecue in the back, head off down the beach, beers by the water, snags on the barbie, boys, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Does it get any better? This is where I'm gonna wrap it up, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I know this has turned into a long video. Let me know if you preferred it all in the one hit or if I should have done the smart YouTuber thing and split each of the jobs up and had a month's worth of content. <laughs> Got another podcast coming soon. Make sure you subscribe for that. If you'd like to support your boys, you can head to talkhub.com.au. Send us a voice message and pick yourself up some merch. We have the Pick Your Poison tees and hoodies in stock and I'm shipping them out daily. Thanks again so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. And until then, see you around. Cheers.